Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Barrett, per, per, I am wrong, Burgundy. Barrett Perlman, welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. I am so stoked to have you here. In one word, how would you say you're feeling in this very moment? Mm, in one word, I would say I am feeling pleasurably excited. I'm very mm. excited to be here today. I like it. There's like a hyphen in between all those words. Uh, we'll let that work. That's awesome. Uh, pleasure, pleasurably excited. Pleasurably. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that's hard for me to say. Let's uh, all take a deep breath into that. Pleasure, excitement, and exhale, let it go. Oh, I love that. That's just so playful. I, l I love that. Cool. Well, let's unpack all of this. Barry, we're going to get into the pleasure. We're going to get into the excitement, the goddess energy, your reconnection mm -hmm. with that feminine archetype of the goddess and so much more. But before we do, I'm just really curious because we've connected through Instagram. I've been on your podcast, but we haven't really like totally dropped in or anything like that. And I think this would be really helpful for the listeners as well. But you're a pro retired wakeboarder, is that right? That is correct. Yeah, former professional wakeboarder. Oh, tell us all about that. <laughs> that was uh, what a time to have been alive um, during the height of the action sports era when X Games was going big. But in the early 2000s to um, 2010s, it was a, a great time to be a professional athlete in wakeboarding. I got to travel the world. I was consistently ranked one of the top 10 professional wakeboarders in the world. And it was felt like such a dream living in Australia, traveling to New Zealand, Colombia, Canada, Hawaii, all over the place to share the joy of wakeboarding and to um, capitalize on the lake, which was my office at the time. It's so funny. I remember in high school being like, uh, when I grow up, I just want to wear board shorts and sandals uh, to work and be like a wakeboard instructor, drive a boat or just work at the lake. <laughs> so yeah. that totally relates. Where, where'd you grow up? I grew up in South Florida. So I'm originally from Stewart, Florida, just outside of West Palm Beach. And then um, went and went to college in Orlando, which is like the wakeboard capital of the world. And so from living in Orlando, it's like, there's a lake in five minutes in every direction. It's like the land of lakes, basically. And that was where I really got to up my skill. And Did you start wakeboarding from a young age? I did not. <clears throat> um, well, I guess like 14. I actually went snowboarding first. Um, I had a, a long history with sports. I basically tried them all and hated them all. And uh, I went through a phase where I was convinced that the sun was going to give you skin cancer. So I didn't go outside. And I finally realized I started watching snowboarding on TV. And I was like, that's a sport that actually looks cool. And I begged my parents to take me snowboarding. We had a winter timeshare in Tahoe. So my dad agreed to take me and my stepbrother. And I was, con I went and I, I loved it. I just loved it so much. And I decided that I wanted to become a professional snowboarder. And my parents went, Barrett, we live in South Florida. 
closest mountain is like 14 hours away. You are not going to become a professional. We are not moving. So, you know, you can pursue that after high school, whatever you want to do, but we're not moving. So think of something else. And as luck would have it, my next door neighbor at my dad's house ran a wakeboard school out of his out of his house. And so um, I ran into him kind of in the backyard one day and said, hey, I hear these two sports are similar. Could you teach me to wakeboard? And he did. And um, turned out he was one of the top coaches in the country. So he quickly helped me put together and learn tricks and put together contest runs and got me competing in the junior women's circuit. And then I just fell in love with it from there, from about 15 years old onwards. 15. So for, uh, during your high school years, you were going to high school uh, at the local high school, I presume, and you were also traveling internationally and competing? I didn't start traveling internationally until I went to college. Um, I'd say when I was in high school, I rode the junior women's division. Um, so there were two tournaments a year that I went to that were local in the United States. What was it like in your college years to become a professional wakeboarder, one of the top in the sport and travel international? What was that like? Um, there's a song that just like like came into my head, which was Party Like a rock star." I don't know if you remember that rap song. Sing it for us. No, I was just kidding. Yeah, I want party to like a rock. Party oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, a yeah. rock star. Party. It, yeah. Um, so that comes to mind because that was a bit of the times um, back then was it was a lot of partying. It was a lot of just waking up and going out on the lake, sometimes having two or three wakeboard sessions a day. Um, I was very focused on my fitness, but I was also um, in college full time. And so my life kind of really revolved around and I did a lot of other things, too. I um, was an intern at Wakeboarding Magazine, which is now Trans World Wake. So I was yeah, with them two days a week. I also ran the Collegiate Wakeboard Association for the United States that governed all of college wakeboarding. So I was planning events around the country as well. So um, my my life was like eat, breathe, sleep, wakeboarding. And I think a lot of athletes can really relate to when you are so committed, whether it's at a high school level, a collegiate level, or a professional level, the amount of of things we actually give up in our lives to be able to hold and honor that commitment, the amount of school dances I missed or uh, freshman orientation for college or um, parties because I there was one one year I think I rode 25 wakeboard tournaments in one one year. So that was um, half of my weekends every uh, that year. Um, so there's just like a lot that was put on the sidelines in order to just hone in and focus on this obsession with wakeboarding, which made me so good at wakeboarding, but also um, didn't have a lot of what I now understand as as life balance. Yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. And at what point did things kind of transition away from wakeboarding into whatever was next, which eventually got you to where you're at now? I'd say around the economy crash of 2008, mm -hmm. that was when um, I was planning on like really fully making a good living wakeboarding. And instead, all of my funding got stripped away from me, except for my travel expenses. And then it sort of became this path of what do I do now? I thought this was the way forwards. And now I see that this industry isn't sustainable in the way that I wanted it to be without becoming like a wakeboard coach, like you thought was the dream. But man, wakeboard coaches and camps, they they hustle hard. It is every single day without fail, seven days a week, um, driving that boat, coaching kids on the back of the wakeboard. And it's fun, but um, wasn't quite what I had in mind for my life. And so at that time, I started to get back into acting. I'd been passionate about acting as a kid and modeling. And I quickly met a director from Los Angeles who invited me out. And so I ended up moving to Los Angeles in 2010, knowing that that would bring an end to my wakeboard career. And from there, I transitioned into becoming a Hollywood stunt woman and then producer. And so I kind of got to ride the waves a bit more of the action and the adrenaline. Um, and with the stunts, I eventually kind of got a little tired of the unpredictability of it and got into more reliable producing and produced shows for like MTV and MSNBC and Snapchat. And 
even from there, got really tired of working 60, 70 hours a week. And Mm -hmm. from there, uh, I had a, a big snowboard accident that challenged my ability to breathe for like a month. And um, as I've heard you talk a lot about in your work, you know, your whole acronym right now is is breathe, breath. And that is just the most important life force energy that we have. And through that struggle with breathing, I got into the healing arts. And then my Mm. whole life began to change. That was when I really began to embrace any sort of feminine energy within myself. The, The healing arts are known to be, quote unquote, on the feminine side of the spectrum. And that was really, really life-changing for me. So much to unpack there. Thank you for sharing all of that. And it definitely seems like party like a rock star has been your ethos uh, in the early days, at least. Um, So I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up because it's one of my instant favorite movies. But have you seen Fall Guy yet? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so good. So listeners, check out this movie, Fall Guy. It's so good. It's about the stunt uh, men and women in Hollywood. And it's it's got everything you'd want in the movie. It's so good. It's hilarious. That said, going a little bit deeper, there's a documentary that came out in, I believe, May of 2020 that instantly took off like wildfire on YouTube and then instantly was banned. And I don't think you can find it on YouTube anymore, but there's a site called BitShoot. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. You know that one? I'm not familiar with it. I mean, you know, let's just call it a thought manipulation free website as opposed to a conspiracy website, you know, um, but basically where things get shadow banned, you can go there, find stuff. And this documentary is called Out of Shadows. Have you heard of it? Hmm. Um. And not off the top of my head, but I think the story rings a bell for what you're about to say. So, yeah, totally. I'll uh, send you a link and I'll set, I'll put it in the show notes so you guys can check it out. Um, this very much sent me on a dark night of the soul when I watched it. I mean, let's rewind back the clock to May of 2020. We're about two months less than that into lockdowns, not knowing what is happening. And that was a long month, two months. And This documentary really revealed a lot. And the reason why I bring it up is the producer, the writer, the guy that did the whole thing, I forget his name, I'm blanking, but he was a stuntman in Hollywood. And basically he, I'm going to say broke his back. It was a serious injury that had to do with his back. I don't remember exactly what it was, but that got him into his spiritual journey at first being like, oh, you know, like, I don't believe in this stuff. Like it's what, you know, just what is it? And then, you know, one thing led to another. And then he started to uncover like the conditioning and programming of Hollywood and so much more, which I am just drawing the parallel of you being a stunt person and then having the snowboard accident, the physical accident that kind of led to, it seems, your spiritual awakening, right? Um, So sense. Yeah, it seems like that. So how how did this all unfold for you? I'm curious in terms of like the awakening process. What did that look like for you? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, right around that time as well, I had a really big um, mushroom journey because I struggled a lot my whole life with depression, really deep, deep bouts of depression. And um it never always felt like it was warranted from this lifetime. Like the lows were just unreasonably low. And um, I was going through a breakup and I had this mushroom journey and I, on the journey, um, was actually walked through from a higher consciousness how to love myself for the very first time in what was probably my entire life. And that would have been about 2016. Um so that started to open this whole new f- field for me. I, at that point, I'd already been meditating for about four years. I, I knew the power of meditation. I had tattoos and owed to what wonderful things meditation had done for me. Um, but it was when I started working with the psychedelics as well, and which I really hadn't dabbled in. Um, most of my partying career had been alcohol. And alcohol is is such a depressant um, and something I'm very cautious with 
now knowing that my mood can be so sensitive to it. But through this psychedelic journey and through this awakening and it, it reconnected me to my higher consciousness. It reconnected me to <clears throat> what we might want to call spirit guides. It reconnected me to an intelligence that felt so outside myself because I couldn't have thought up those words myself to help me. Mm. And because of that and because of how that shifted for me in that specific first like spiritual awakening, um, I dove more into it and I said, there's, there's something else here. Let me explore. Wow. What if I, if every time I take psychedelics and I, I walk away feeling this insane love for myself, like, why wouldn't I be taking psychedelics all the time? Yeah. And it turns out there's a lot more to unpack there than just take the psychedelics. There's a lot of integration to be had around there and not every journey is filled with love and light. Sometimes it's filled with a lot of darkness and a lot of shadows and what I've really learned since is is the beauty of the dichotomy of the light and the darkness. We don't get to have the light without having the darkness. And the darkness isn't bad just because it's dark. It's actually quite beautiful. And there are so many things there to be illuminated from the golden light um, that we just, we've been pre-programmed, we've been preconditioned to say, oh, this part of me is is wrong, or I feel guilty here, or, I feel shame, or this is bad and and through all of that i've learned to get away from right and wrong bad and good and guilt and really learn to bring more love to hold more love and in holding more love i get to hold more love for myself and that's a place that 10 year ago me never knew was possible 20 year ago me never knew was possible um so I, I know I kind of went on a little diatribe there and did a kind of circle back it. to Preach. answering the question. Preach. There's there's a lot that's coming up for me and I'm trying to think of which way to to go. But I think um, since I know that you help people to prepare and integrate with medicine ceremonies now, what would you say are some of the more important things for people to understand, to know as they're starting to get curious, like, hey, would this whole like plant and earth medicine thing be a good path for me? I think one of the the greatest things to hold true is like, are they being called to it? Because the plant medicines are their psycho spiritual tool. And what that means is that it it's a it's a method that we can use to help us unlock our souls, to help us ascend consciousness, to help us heal. It's one of many tools, the same way that meditation is a tool, the same way that breath work is a tool, the same way that gratitude is a tool. Plant medicines are a tool. And so is it going to be the right tool for you? It's, it's a very vulnerable place. And are you ready to really let go? Do you really desire to let go of the blockages that are preventing you from feeling your best? Because there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of programs, there's a lot of pain. And what the plant medicines let us do is go in there in a safer container, hopefully one that's been constructed with um, a guide in mind that is a safe container where you feel comfortable knowing that you can let go and release and and we can bring a more healing and awareness and light into that space. So I I am such a huge proponent of them because they were life-changing for me and I think that they're life-changing for many others who are ready and willing to roll up their sleeves a little bit and go, you know what? There's never been a better time than now to become the best version of myself. And I am ready to be authentic as fuck. And so like, let's go now. I'm all about it. Let's go. So with uh, another thing I know you're passionate about as well is like plant and earth medicines is more than just healing work or healing from trauma and even breath work journeys. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about myself recently, because a lot of times I'm talking about like healing from trauma, but it is so much more than that. Can you tell us about uh, some of the reasons someone might want to be on this path other than, say, quote unquote, healing? Sure. Um, 
yeah, like let's not get stuck in the loop of healing and healing and continuously. Right. We're always healing. Like, yes, we're always healing. And when you've done some of the legwork already, then these get to become tools that you use for ascending consciousness, for growing your spirituality, for connecting with yourself. Um, one of my favorite things to do is take a, a large dose of mushrooms by myself and really go into somatic work with myself. And that involves stretching. It involves breathing into stuck points in the body and allowing for them to expand. It involves screaming. It involves crying. It involves um, meditating. Um, one of my favorite tools right now is humming. And so I love bringing in humming with the psychedelic medicines uh, because our, our egos are so much more offline and our bodies are so much more programmable that when we hum, we can actually change our energy field. So for instance, if there's been a lot of like fear or anxiety, not only does humming calm the nervous system, but then you can program your energy field with a new way of being. And perhaps that's, um, I am a, a radiant being of love as opposed to I, I am a scared being of what, what might happen today. Now I am a strong, radiant being of love. And we can hum that into the energy field. And when we do it also with the plant medicine, then it, it has an even greater impact. It's kind of like a magnifying glass on the, the tool that we're using with it. So I love using them for spiritual growth and ascension as well. What does that humming sound and look like, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, there's a, a humming method I'm developing called the hummingbird breath. And it's a little bit of a breath work as well as a hum. So it's involving a three-part breath. So breathing through the nose into the diaphragm, through the nose into the lungs, and then humming out through the nose. And really extending that hum out as long as you can exhale. And so going in on that, even just a breath like that, say 10 times in a row, filling the diaphragm as full as you can, filling the lungs as full as you can, and slowly humming will um, increase nitric oxide in the body. It'll decrease your heart rate. It will bring down the nervous system so you can begin to feel that static go away, and it creates a calmer mind. And this really beautiful place for us to then operate from where we get to step away from fight or flight and recenter and reground and essentially reclaim time. Like, mm -hmm. ah, now that I feel safe, what's the next best thing? Beautiful. And I love the name too, the hummingbird breathwork method or mm -hmm. something along those lines, right? Hummingbird. Yeah, hummingbird breath. Hummingbird breath. Yeah. You know, you guys uh, check out the show notes and connect with Barry. Uh, go to her Instagram. She's constantly putting out like amazing marketing. And I'm not just saying that for like, uh, but let me let me be clear because it's intentional and it's it's with love. It's not like a, a thirst trap or, you know, out of integrity marketer that's coming into the spiritual world where we see that a lot. And I, I do want to give you credit because anytime I, I see you come up with something new, it's very much along the lines of what you just shared with us, the hummingbird breath where it's like, wow, that's that's original. That That's very original and it's catchy and it, it makes so much sense, like hummingbird breath and you're humming. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, I love it. So great job. Keep up all the great work there. Just to circle back on the journeys uh by yourself right because now we're going to put on our responsible uh uh podcaster we're both podcaster and integration coaches uh, hats and whatnot now for those of you new just understand neither of us are encouraging you to take five grams of mushrooms and do this on your own if you've never done anything like that before additionally you know i i've um I like to experiment on myself sometimes. And sometimes I share that on social media. I think that gets met with judgment. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm just being authentic and vulnerable. And that's where I am. I wouldn't want to work with, say, a facilitator who just puts on a show and behind the scenes, they're reckless, right? It's like, mm -hmm. no, this is who I am. 
If you think it's reckless, then maybe that's something for you to look at in your judgment, right? Mm -hmm. That said, I remember in, again, 2020, you know, doing a six gram mushroom uh, journey by myself. And I was still newish, newer on this path. I, I mean, I have been, I don't want to say working with um, mushrooms, but recreationally using mushrooms um, since high school, you know, and some uh, times in college, uh, but very different when you start to go in. Uh, ceremonially. That said, I, I've heard from a lot of people, and this was my experience as well with the six grams, where it's like, not that nothing happened, but it's a totally different energy when you don't have someone else facilitating and holding space. And I think one of the beautiful things to highlight that Barrett shared with us is you go into this not only as if it is a ceremony because it is, but also with the intention of the somatic work and all these different things. For me, I remember going back uh, to this six gram journey I had. I was like, oh, I'm just going to put a blindfold on some music like I, I set an intention, meditate, do all those things. But I was literally laying there for two, three hours and nothing happened. <laughs> nothing mm -hmm. at all. Um so I think there's just so much to be said when you're journeying on your own, just in terms of safety and expectations and more than anything, I, I would really recommend, I know Barrett would feel this way too, to work with a sitter or facilitator. Um, and for those of you guys that are more experienced, just know like we're speaking to you if we're saying like you, you want to try something on your own, you know? Yeah, right. certainly don't start with uh, six grams, five grams, four grams on your own. It's uh, strongly not recommended. If you've never worked with the medicine, I highly, highly, highly recommend a guide to work with, whether in a group setting or one-on-one. -on -one. And once you have that experience under your belt, um, if you desire to do so, then taking those larger doses are something that you work up to. But I think you make a really great point in that every single ceremony every single journey is different and it's always going to be that way and you can never recreate the same thing twice like no matter how hard you try it's literally impossible um i've had a, a heroic dose one day that was life-changing and i was on a retreat so five days later i went to take another heroic dose and had virtually nothing that happened uh, exact same dose it must have been about six grams or so and all that I felt was completely uncomfortable. I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. It was, it was like wildly bad. And I was trying to listen to the nature and not do music. And finally, I remember I had to come out of that and just be like, I need music. I need something to, to turn this a little bit here for me. But um, you never know too, because every strain is different. Every flush is different um, with regards to the actual mushroom mushrooms themselves and so sometimes we have diminished experiences because because we are blocked in places and what I find with a lot of clients who um, tend to feel really heavy with mushrooms specifically or they tend to feel um yeah I think heavy is like the best best word for it that that's often a sign that energy needs to be moved and while we can sit on the floor and be a dead weight on the floor, if you simply get up and move and start dancing and begin to move that energy through your body so that where you are blocked opens, then it allows for the medicine to really come online. And so there's a few different tips and tricks like that that a, a guide should be able to work with someone through and, and help open up those floodgates for a, a deeply personal experience. 100%. And I, I know for me, mushrooms have been something that I've not worked with as much in recent years. And I mean, that's a very vague statement because I think uh, right now at the time of this recording, we're in June of 2024. And I've probably had like uh, maybe four or five type uh, ceremonies, not like ceremony ceremonies, but, you know, experiences kind of similar to what you experience or what you shared. So it's all, it's all relative, right? You know, I'm like, that's not a whole lot. Right. But at the same time, that's like almost once a month. That said, 
I've noticed in the past few years that like every time I drop in with mushrooms, just massive wave of anxiety. So I no longer will do just like a casual small dose hike or anything like that. I'm like, I, I just need my own space. And to your point, anytime I'm able to ground, like luckily living by the ocean and going in the ocean, doing some breath work, I'm able to start to move through it, which is a lot of my six step breath process, right? It's mm -hmm. feeling that which we both talk about. Uh, so let's transition a little bit away from this, but into what we teased at the beginning with your feminine energy and a, a reclaiming of that, because I can see as being like so disciplined in the more masculine energy of how you need to show up in being an athlete. And then with the different professions in Hollywood stunts, and you mentioned uh, different companies you were working with, what's it been like to kind of lean into the feminine more? Oh, it's been life changing, uh, especially as a woman who had no feminine balance. Like I was a backwards hat wearing skater shoed girl who was often mistaken for a lesbian. I love lesbians. They're wonderful. But I just often had this like very tomboy energy. And I'm able to tie it back to having not felt really safe with my mom. My mom and I were the ones that butt heads growing up and I felt so safe with my dad. And so, yeah, I had those masculine traits of, of training whether I wanted to or not and showing up to look fear in the face and say, I've got the courage to jump anyways and putting the, the structures and the systems in place that it took to be a good producer. And when I switched then into massage therapy, that was all about tending to other people's needs. And it started to open up this field of sensation around me where I got to listen deeper. I think I hadn't even been listening to my own body. Um, I didn't even know what that meant for the longest time, to, to listen to your body, to feel safe in your body. Those were words that um, weren't even in my radar. And now here I was creating this, this safety and this relaxation for others. And it brought me into a deep state of awareness that then opened up my awareness for my feminine and my masculine energy. And I think, you know, both men and women, we both have masculine and feminine energies. And when we are, as a woman, when we get to operate more in our feminine, it, it really brings out this special, special light in us. And I just didn't have that for so long that as I began to reconnect with that, it started to really allow for my life to flow. It started to really allow for magic to come back into my life. Um, I got in touch with my intuition. I got to get more in touch with sacred world. I appreciate nature in a way beyond just looking at it and seeing it for its beauty, but in a way that's like, oh, I see what the birds are doing. I'm listening to the messages that they're carrying. I feel when the wind blows that it's it's carrying information that um, is helpful. I walk around and I, you know, I touch the trees and I, I like to learn about what's what's going on in the land and what, what are the feelings and the sensations here. And so I've gotten so passionate lately about helping other women as well reconnect to their feminine energy because if they were like me and they grew up in this world where it was like push the feelings down don't talk about your period like I I wasn't one of those girls who got to not go to school because I had cramps like and and I wasn't really taught anything about being a woman from my mom and now that I'm 38 years old and I'm discovering about all of these ways in which my body has a, a a month long cycle that I could have been honoring this whole time, it's created a whole new way of being. It's created a whole new way of having grace for myself and a whole new way of showing up with love and compassion for myself in a way that was missing my entire life. And that, that deep depression that I talked about carrying my whole life was just a lot of the absence of love for myself. And always coming down with the hammer, do better, be better, get up, you're not doing enough. And gosh, when we find that grace within, 
um, everything gets just happier to start with, happier. And, and we get to be more authentic. And it feels really fucking good. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's so interesting, the differences between men and women. I've been thinking a lot the past couple of weeks about like how much stronger women are than men. And I don't mean like you guys can lift more weight than us. I, I, I mean, I've thought about this a lot throughout my life, but it just keeps coming up um, in the past couple of weeks. Like I couldn't imagine like having a period once a month, once a month and what that's like or childbirth, any of these things. And the, it's more, I can't speak to it. Right. But it seems like it's more than a pain tolerance. And, you know, a lot of us men can be real wusses. And th this is actually a funny story. I was at a event, a YPO, a young president's organization event with a uh, buddy Grant and he has this uh, ice bath, this ice uh, cold plunge company. And I was already like thinking about this a lot at the time. And then he started to bring up how, like how much stronger women are than men and specifically for the ice bath. And he goes, yeah, sometimes when I'm like talking a woman through the ice bath, that are, this just, just happened recently. He goes, this one was like, I've given birth five times, <laughs> you know, like, it, like this ice bath, like not much, right? But to your point with all of this, like one of the things that I'd like to highlight is this cycle of the month. You know, I think that is so powerful. And for a lot of men, we're missing out on that. I know for me, when I first got down this path of spirituality, I was very much like you and just being like, show me everything. I want to experience it all. And I saw a new moon ceremony at a yoga studio. I was like, what the heck is a new moon ceremony? And that was the first time I went and it was profound beyond belief. And I'm not, I haven't been on my game. I would say the past year, maybe two years of being in the flow with the new moons and full moons. But I know for me as a man, that really helps me to tap into more of this feminine and yin type flow that we're talking about. You know, a lot of things that you expressed a few times during this podcast, it's like we have some uh, telepathy going on where like before you said it, I was thinking it, one of which being nature. And I've been on a big bird kick recently. It is so easy to get in touch with nature just to start looking at the different critters. And for me recently, the past few months, it's been birds. In fact, even just... Uh, couple of hours ago, uh, getting home on my bike after yoga, the crows were calling and I was like, Hey guys, what's up? How you doing? <laughs> you know, like starting to talk to the crows, Perfect. um, but I, I love it all. I love it. Yeah. Well, birds are these divine messengers of the planet. Like not only do their songs keep us in resonance, they let us know when something's wrong. They let us know when it's sunrise. They let us know when it's sunset. The birds are always talking. They are always transmitting those messages. And, and so really beginning to listen. And when you see one, like ask it exactly like you said, hey, hey, what's up? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And if you hold that eye contact, chances are you're going to get a hit of a message of something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it's like, hey, you should play today. Sometimes it's like, hey, take your shoes off and ground here with me for a minute. Sometimes it's a bird just saying, hey, and that you're clocking in and paying attention. But begin to clock in and pay attention because there are messages everywhere. You're, we are just usually not decoding them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll link uh, the Soja song uh, messages in the show notes. That's uh, one of my favorites. Uh, speaking of, I, I got back from Bali five, six months ago and there's always squirrels every single day in my backyard. And I remember one of the first days being back, the squirrels didn't run. They actually like were like, oh, like they want to hang out with me. And they can, to this point, the animals can feel our vibration. A lot of time after a medicine ceremony, we start to experience that we're more in sync with the animals as messengers. And I love your point of eye contact. I'm not sure that's something I've really thought about, but that is true. Like if you really drop drop in with them that is one way we can 
and actually raise our vibration and sharing it with them. So thank you for sharing that. And one more thing that I wanted to touch on was worth. This has come up a few times now in this podcast. And I mean, it's self-love, you know, it's the answer, right? That's something that was a profound download for me several years back. And something that I've been working on is uh, my relationship to worth. And mm -hmm. I think that is like potentially the number one core wound that us as humans have as a through line for, I think uh, every single person can relate to a core wound and that stemming like the deepest. And I do believe I'm playing with this. So it's not a firm belief, but I do believe like if you think like you've overcome your worth or like you don't resonate with worth I, or feeling unworthy, I think there's a little bit of resistance in lying to yourself because I really haven't come across anyone who truly doesn't have an ounce of unworthiness. So I'd love to hear what comes up for you and any tips, advice in your journey in allowing yourself to not only have self-love, but to embrace your worth. Mm. What a heavy banger for um, something I feel like I'm personally going through in my life right now. And gosh, worthiness, it, I think it invites us to be able to zoom out. Something we forget to do is zoom out. And when we're struggling with our own worthiness, it becomes about what, what value can I deliver to these immediate people or beings or sentient beings that I can see immediately in front of me. And we forget to zoom out and, and look at all of the life experience that we've had. And just because we may not be serving 10,000 people all at once, maybe we're simply serving one or two or three. Maybe it's a partner. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a child. That doesn't mean that we're not serving, that we're not worthy, that we're not being called to be of service and that what we have to serve our own inherent medicine that we have to serve isn't a value you know each of us are here as souls experiencing you know divinity experiencing the world learning something and we each have this unique set of circumstances that we look at the world through that no two set of circumstances are the same and so we have something of value just inherently in that nature like you have learned something that is worth sharing with someone else that someone else values whose life is going to be changed because of that and so yeah, yeah a worthiness it's like uh, you could journal about it for days right zooming out and and really tapping into and reminding yourself where the places are that you have created value and maybe that's not monetary maybe that's not a checklist of tangible things that you created maybe it's intangible things as well maybe you created a safe and, and loving home for a child maybe you were the, the hand that someone held when they felt like they couldn't go on anymore maybe there was just a, a shoulder to cry on right and so each of us has so much value that we forget to give ourselves credit for daily i feel like i'm giving myself the session that I need right now, you know? Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. I was uh, going to say that I can guarantee for anyone listening, for myself and for you, Barry, all of us are going to feel better, not only the rest of our day, but the next few days, because by speaking it and allowing ourselves to feel it, then we can move through it. I mean, I was just expressing to Barry before we hit record that I'm struggling big time too right now with worth. And for me, that is tied to expectations. And I think a lot of um, what we're both sharing here is societal conditioning and programming and comparisonitis, looking at others mm -hmm. and being, I should be like this, or I should, those, the, these people, that people or whatever. And to your point, like maybe it's as simple as like being a parent, and and giving it all you have and we're always doing our best and we are so hard on ourselves and society kind of lends itself to you know keeping us in that more dense and lower vibration of victimhood 
And this is our, our opportunity to r- rise above that simply by allowing ourselves to feel it. Not about putting on a fake mask. I am so passionate about this, but like the movie uh, Barbie, have you seen that one? Oh, I haven't seen Barbie yet. No. I'm obsessed with that movie. I think it's one of the <laughs> the, the deepest, profound, spiritual movies I've ever seen, especially since on the surface, it's about a doll and you, would, you wouldn't expect it or see it coming. But at its core, like, you know, I think... Um, looking at women specifically or just anyone that would want to play with a barbie doll i guess i put it that way there's this notion of everything is perfect and always be happy always be smiling right and the whole movie is about like things going wrong for this stereotypical barbie as she's called by played by margot robbie and instead of just putting on that face fake mask of everything is perfect and This is the movement of toxic positivity right now, where it's always feel good, always think of positive thoughts, do not ever entertain a negative thought or feeling that is so entirely toxic. And why I love this movie is the whole movie is about this this Barbie doll allowing herself to feel these denser emotions as she goes through a dark night of the soul and then eventually has a transformation, which is the hero's journey and this whole spiritual process and why we incarnate on earth for so many reasons. So at the end of the day, like what I was saying earlier, you know, worthiness is, um, it's got its highs and its lows. You know, I, I think it's easy to get back there. And one thing I'm going to do is I'll send this to you, Bear, to you, Barry, and I'll put it in the show notes. And it's a book by Adya Shanti. I forget what it's called, but it's all about worthiness. And I'm going to re-listen to this um, starting this afternoon because I know it's going to help me. And I guarantee you, if you're someone listening to this, that you're resonating with this, check out this book by Adya Shanti, all about worthiness. It's legit. Sounds legit. Yeah. And, and now that I know that that's what the Barbie movie's about, I'm going to bump that up a little higher on the top of the list because that's so important and what is it it takes like 90 seconds to really sit with an emotion feel it to allow it to process out and then we can let that go and we can come back to a place of centeredness and is it really as bad as we think it is is it really all of the lower frequency things that we think it is or did we just need to give them some space and give them some grace and allow ourselves a little bit more self-love to 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 grow and to expand and to to brush the dirt off and to get get back up and give it another go. Exactly, exactly. That's it. And I have another question for you too. Um, what what do you feel about when things are challenging? When it feels like you're banging your head against the wall and you can't get things going, you're swimming upstream. What what do you think about that? What's the way to respond to that? Hmm. That is. Personally, when I love to tap in on a medicine ceremony, that is when I love to get back in touch with myself. I think when we feel like we're banging our heads against a wall, we've we've lost our connection with flow and we've started to try to force a square into a circle. And it can be a lot about just coming back to reopening our energy channels. So maybe your medicine ceremony is with the breath. Maybe your medicine ceremony is with mushrooms. Maybe your medicine ceremony is with um, art. Art's a beautiful medicine as well. Doing something to get you away from focusing on the problem that's kind of got you like a butterfly stuck in the ceiling and reopening that connection to play so that new ideas can come through and new problem solving can come through from that place of excitement and pleasure and joy. Thank you so much for that reminder. That's something that I need to hear for myself. And I I know for me, this is something that I get stuck in where I start to figure out the things that worked for me, whether it's a ceremony, it's a breathwork uh, journey, going to art class or painting on my own, cooking as a creative expression, Mm -hmm. getting out in the ocean, hot, cold therapy, all these different things that for the most part, outside of art, like I'm doing mostly on daily or at least weekly basis. Um, But then when I get stuck, and I think a lot of us resonate with this, 
is we go to our creative outlets and we're like, okay, what can I do? But to your point and like the deeper layer of this, which I started to uncrack like two years ago is what are those creative expressions that you don't do? Like putting yourself out of your comfort zone and trying something new. Like I got electric guitar and started playing heavy metal for about a month or two. Uh, two years ago, and that only lasted for like a month or two, but it was exactly the medicine I needed for that time, you know? So I, I think that's a really powerful point in these creative expressions as well. Yeah. And something that's kind of being downloaded to me right now, too, is um, remembering the power of our own voice. Like sometimes we get in these situations and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to draw, I'm going to think, I'm going to breathe. But sometimes we just need to make some fucking sound. Like we need to tap back in. Um, for instance, this last month, I've been really sick. I had a lot of asthma and lung infection. And um, I took some time the other night to finally just like sit down and hum for a couple hours. And it like rejuvenated my energy field and it rejuvenated my voice. Like my ability to even speak felt weak. You could hear it. So sometimes we need to yell, like grab a pillow, scream into it and get that vocal cords moving because we're often just like really stuck here in our throat chakra realm too. It's so true. It's so true. And there's a lot to unpack there. Um, last night, actually, I went to a, a four part class. It's once a week uh, for four weeks, all about like using your voice uh, uh, mm -hmm. for performance. I don't know how what the class is called that I signed up for but um I essentially signed up for you know helping myself to figure out what this voice thing is all about as I've been podcasting for seven years and keynote speaking and things like that and one of the first exercises we did you're gonna love this uh it was like make all these different movements and for those of you watching YouTube you can kind of see me smushing my face or whatever and then she had us like yawn and she started to say a few spiritual things and i just uh, oh i know what she said something along the lines of like how if you look at a horse or you see animals they move their faces in all kinds of weird ways and i was like yeah weird to us but it's not weird because for anyone that's done a deep mushroom journey ayahuasca ceremony or anything similar you've probably exper experienced like those uh primal yawns and I can think back to a few of those ceremonies where I literally felt like a lion waking up from a long nap of my entire lifetime. This was probably the first night of ayahuasca ever. And then it happened a few times after that, where just these massive yawns coming through. It was just like, whoa. And I think, um, you know, there's one thing that I took away from that and it's to honor my voice more. We did this exercise. You're going to love this and listeners too, where basically you journal for however long, do it for at least five minutes, maybe 10, 20 minutes. And you're, you're speaking to your voice and you're saying, Hey voice, remember that time something positive happened. Right. And you were so whatever. And then she didn't tell us to do this, but it's kind of like, um, uh, daily pages or, um, yeah, it's kind of like, a uh, uh, I'm stream of consciousness writing uh, what came through was the voice, my voice started to write back to me and my voice started to say, and I could feel like it, no mess and no canvas, no nothing. And, but I could feel like it was actually like my voice speaking to me. It wasn't me. And it was saying how like, I am not grateful. I don't honor it and all these different things like that. It was so eye opening for me that just like these simple exercises just to land in your body and in your face and your vocal cords and like do some yawns intentional. Like, man, if, if I totally forgot about that till you brought up the voice. So thank you for bringing that up. You are yeah. so welcome. And yeah, that's powerful. It's like, our faces are these expressions of ourselves. And like, how often do you massage your face? It's a wonderful thing to do on the medicine as well is like really get into your cheeks, get into your forehead, get into your chin, get into your jaw and, and bring it all back online. Like swish it around and shake it around. And it's all part of just getting our systems open and flowing so that 
we can be in this like pleasurable, excited, kundalini risen kind of state. Oh, okay. speak to it. Before we go, um, you're into kundalini? I'm mean, getting into kundalini, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I've been getting into kundalini the past six, eight months or so as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, talk talk with us real quick about your experience or your fascination, interest, anything with kundalini. Oh, man, I think kundalini is such an interesting little powerhouse. It's like our our own energy and it and it kind of there's two different lines of it these two different serpents that wind around our body and i've had the the pleasure of being in medicine ceremony and and watching them both wind up all the way to the top of my head um so i think it's very potent and powerful that when we get our chakras open which are our energy centers we have seven different energy centers in the body the chakras that are the kundalini can then wind and flow between them that it gets us in that like effortless flow excitement pleasure state and that's like the ecstasy and the bliss that we're really meant to experience each day mm -hmm. absolutely i i have a theory which we're not going to have time to unpack but that basically what bufo 5meo dmt is is it's giving you a kundalini awakening so the reason why uh integration of a bufo ceremony can be so difficult is because we're bypassing doing the work to earn the right to activate the heart chakra and when the heart mm -hmm. chakra gets activated it's kind of known as like the lower three are the more like shadow work type so we're bypassing those lower three. So then in the integration, it's kind of now starting to look at the lower three chakras and see at these challenges. And as we, to your point of practice in Kundalini, we're clearing the pathway for that to rise so that we can actually alleviate some of the symptoms or situations that we're starting to call in. And yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm so fascinated by Kundalini. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And you can tell when it's firing, like you, you have that like little extra pep in your step and things sparkle a little brighter and you're just like excited and, and it's easy to choose where to put your attention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and for me, I've been working on those root locks too. Um, I learned this actually for, from Aaron Abke. Um, I haven't heard too many people talk about it, but he calls it Kriya Pranayama, where basically you do a root lock and then you roll back your eyes as if you're looking towards your third eye with your eyes closed. And you hold your root as you inhale all the way up and then continue to squeeze and then hold at the top and then exhale, let it all go. So it's kind of like box breathing, but in, including your root and your attention is from your root to your third eye which to your point like that's shakti coming up to meet shiva um so yeah so much to unpack there so the modern hippie you're for sure modern hippie i love it that is the name of your podcast which is linked in the show notes guys check it out barrett what other projects are you working on these days uh, that's that's the big one right now um and i'm also just enjoying helping people come to plant medicines. I love working with people to really unlock their souls in both a, a five month transformation or my new authentic alignment activation. And so if someone is looking to, you know, quickly step into a uh, nervous system regulation and that connection with sacred world, and they're ready to use the plant medicines to, to tap in at that tool, um, I am their go-to girl. So let's have a conversation about how to unlock the next level of your life so that it's authentic, so that it's playful and full of passion. Amazing. Well, thank you, Barrett. Thank you. I appreciate how you show up in the world, how you show up for this podcast and continue to do all the great work that you're doing. Guys, check out Barrett's work. All of her links are in the show notes. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Sam.